Hello, Booktube, <laughs> and welcome to your daily penguin. This is our slow waddle through my Penguin Classic collection. Oh, what are you doing, baby? <laughs> uh, one book at a time, one author at a time, one period at a time, and we are in a vein of Penguin Classic Deluxe Editions, and that's what we're looking at today. Uh, this is a novella. You will all know it. It needs no introduction from me, an 1899 novella by Joseph Conrad. This is The Heart of Darkness. Uh, it's a very thin thing. The Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition is gorgeous. This is the, uh, the type of thing they typically do. You've got the French flaps, you've got the, the deckled edges. This one has uh, the full color, the full artwork. Some of them don't, but most Penguin Classic Deluxe Editions have artwork everywhere instead of explanation. They just figure you're going, this is not for schools. You, this is for yourself. You're going to know this book already. That's what they tend to assume. So you have Mike Mignola, the great comic book artist Mike Mignola uh, does the front cover rather rather lazily gives us a heart <laughs> uh, and then he does the back cover and then the inside flap there we go huh uh, and then of course the uh, the back flap the horror the horror I wish that he had been prevailed upon to do spot illustrations throughout but that would probably have been very expensive so I understand why <laughs> why nobody did that uh, and this is the story. You're all going to know it. You're all going to know this story. This is set in colonial Africa. This is the story of a man named Marlow who voyages up the Congo River from one station to another. And the further along he goes, the more he hears about an ivory trader named Mr. Kurtz, who's hailed as the just a vector of amazing otherworldly intelligence. The closer he gets, the more irritated Marlowe gets with those rumors and the more linked he becomes with them and the more debased a world he encounters. He encounters people who've been waiting uh, just forever. Waiting seems to define their life. He encounters all sorts of uh, savages and barbarians in, in, the, in the African interior. He encounters in one horrifying scene uh, a dell, a kind of a kind of dell where sick people have crawled off to just slowly wither and die. Uh, it's a it's a it's a very striking scene. Let me read you a bit of it here. Uh, they were dying slowly. It was very clear. They were not enemies. They were not criminals. They were nothing earthly now, nothing but black shadows of disease and starvation, lying confusedly in the greenish gloom. <laughs> Brought from all the recesses of the coast in all the legality of time contracts, lost in uncongenial surroundings, fed on unfamiliar food, they sickened, became inefficient, and were then allowed to crawl away and rest. These moribund shapes were free as air and nearly as thin. I began to distinguish the gleam of eyes under the trees. Then, glancing down, I saw a face near my hand. The black bones reclined at full length with one shoulder against the tree, and slowly the eyelids rose and sunk, and sunken eyes looked up at me, enormous and vacant. A kind of blind, white flicker in the depths of the orbs, which died out slowly. The man seemed young, almost a boy, but you know with them it's hard to tell. I found nothing else to do but offer him one of my good Swede's ship biscuits I had in my pocket. The fingers closed slowly on it and held. There was no other moment and no other glance. He had tied a bit of white worsted around his neck. Why? Where did he get it? Was it a badge, an ornament, a charm, a propitiary act? Uh, was there any idea at all connected with it? It looked startling around his black neck, this bit of white thread from beyond the seas. Um, and... <sighs> The reservation that you're hearing in my voice is that although I have read this book many times, I have never found a way to venerate it. I know that it is venerated. I, I, I owes a lot of that to the fact that it's short, so it's read in schools. Uh, but I have I have pondered over this book uh, and just cannot make my way inside it. I, and it's not just it's not just Conrad's prose. The English was his third language, and it very much shows, <laughs> as you can tell, even in that excerpt. Uh, his prose is leaden, it's clunky, uh, it's 
self-referential in all the worst ways. <laughs> it doesn't, it, 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 you think when you, I think when I'm reading this book, when I'm getting, you're getting to key dramatic chapters, when a helmsman dies, for instance, of violence, or when Kurtz is finally met, uh, you think, I think, about what some of Conrad's contemporaries would have made of that dramatic material, even if you sort of contracted them to do nothing else, to write about nothing else but what is on the page in here. But even so, it's the book that we have, and other people have fallen in love with it. And I have tried. I've tried with this book, and then, out of guilt, and that guilt is not, is not resolved, I still feel it, uh, out of guilt I then went on and read everything by this author. Many times. Uh, the long novels, the short stories, the adventure stories, the more probing political stuff. And uh, <laughs> a great many people whose, whose literary judgments I respect say, well, none of that's doing it for you, but it's the heart of darkness that is the thing you want to read. That is, that is the distillation of his art. So I keep coming back to this book. And some people say that's not true. Some people tell me that's not true, but that you can find it elsewhere in Typhoon, for instance, or his, or, uh, <sighs> I have tried. <laughs> this is the point I'm trying to make for your Penguin Classic today. I've tried many times to love this author. I've tried many times even to esteem him. And I don't get it. I haven't been able to do it. And uh, clearly the rest of the world has, because you have a Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition, a beautiful thing, that is right now, as far as I know, the only Conrad that I own. Because it's Mike Mignola, because it's such a perfect match of the cover artist with the subject matter. And because, I mean, it has an introduction, it has a foreword by uh, Adam Hochschild, the author of King Leopold's Ghost, uh, that is valuable in its own. I'm sorry, the bean is going crazy here. Why are you going crazy? Huh? Oh, <laughs> why are you going crazy? Huh? You're my own Kurtz. You are. You're my own Kurtz. You think you're a god. <laughs> and everyone else does too because you make them. <laughs> what? <laughs> why are you going crazy? Why? <laughs> Oh, oh goodness, B, what are you doing? Oh, look at this. This is what I have to deal with. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, you savage little dog. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Not so adorable now, is she, Booktube? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, as I was trying to say, <laughs> uh, I, this is the only Conrad that I have, and I keep it because this is an unresolved author for me. I, I know too many people who think this author is the bee's knees, and I, it, unlike in most cases, in most cases where readers that I respect, and in this case we're talking about some readers that I really respect who aren't alive anymore for me to argue with, uh, or for me to ask more pointers from, in this case, uh, it's an, uh, readers I respect have told me that there is something here that I'm missing, and in a lot of cases where I'm told that, I examine the text in question and just decide that is not true. The, the, these friends are wrong, and then I can start psychoanalyzing them. But I'm done with the text. I'm not. I'm not going to have. Uh, I'm not really going to sit patiently while one uh, Brooklyn poetaster after another tells me that Sally Rooney is the greatest person who has ever lived, not just the greatest writer but the greatest human being who has ever lived on the face of the earth, and that she actually invented cooperative megalithic structures in the Dark Ages, in the Stone Ages. And I tell them, well, okay, but she can't actually be responsible for Stonehenge because she wasn't alive then. And they say, no, you just don't get normal people, dude. You just don't get it. <laughs> this is not a case like that. This is an author where I am willing to admit, I'm willing to hold out the possibility that some, someday the penny will drop. It's been a long time and it hasn't happened yet, but it could. Uh, so I keep the Heart of Darkness. I'm pretty sure we'll find out in this Penguin Classic tour, but I'm pretty sure I've got rid of everything else. Uh, the Shadow Line is the only other one that I even remotely kind of, sort of liked, but I kept hoping that sooner or later Conrad would just give the writing task over to... Francis Marriott or somebody and have it done right. But anyway, <laughs> it never happens. So I'm going to keep this, not only because it's a beautiful deluxe edition, but also because I'm not done with this book. I will I will periodically revisit it and see if it makes any more sense. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that is your Penguin Classic for today. Um, it's not a direct personal recommendation. I mean, if you read this and love it, then God love you, because you're doing something, you're finding some key to it that I have not found. Uh, 
But I can certainly recommend this particular Penguin Classic Deluxe Edition because it is gorgeous. This is just beautiful. Don't know that uh, the Heart of Darkness has ever had a better paperback. Uh, but anyway, that's your penguin for today. It's the Heart of Darkness plus plus my own. <laughs> oh God, she's still at it down here. My own thrashing little Congo monster. <laughs> Why are you thrashing around? Why? Oh, now you're acting nice. But the minute I put you down, you're going to attack my toes again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, shoot, shoot. You're becoming the star of the Daily Penguin. You know that? People watch this for you, not for me. They do. They watch this for you, not for me. We went out a little earlier today on what was going to be our medium walk. We start out with a short walk because my little bean is not a morning person. She does not like the morning. She does not like getting out of bed. <laughs> She's the first, the only young dog I've ever had who was like that. My Basset Hound. Lucy, when she was very young, when she was only a few years old, like this dog, she loved getting out of bed. She just needed help getting out of bed. Because after a night of sleeping, she was like an upended turtle. So in the morning, she'd be going, straining herself, trying to get at least one leg underneath her so that she could roll off the edge of the bed. I had to help her every morning, but she did want to do it. This dog, she looks distinctly put upon until at least noon. And then at noon, she's she's really she's willing to get up and go out. It's a luxury. I know it won't last forever, uh, but our our first walk is always short, just business. And then our second walk is a little longer. And then we're we're slowly building up to the day's long walk. But it snowed and it's freezing cold here and, and dark as twilight. So it's she doesn't like that any more than I do, being out in in the winter. So. Uh, so I don't know if that'll happen. We'll go on a walk later today and we'll, we'll stay out for as long as we can manage before either one of us is freezing cold and then we'll come back inside uh, and huddle up in the warmth. Uh, just the sorts of things you expect to hear about May. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, that's your Penguin Classic for today. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.